Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of The Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by the producer of T4 Football, Alex Stewart. Alex, welcome to the show. Hello, thanks very much for having me. Al Alex, obviously been a huge fan of your content and T4 Football for many years, so it's an absolute privilege to have you on. But I suppose one of my biggest curiosities about yourself is, you know, what is your earliest football memory? Uh, well, I'm funnily enough, like I wasn't that into football as a kid um i i played a lot at school um i was not very good i was a goalkeeper um but i was quite bad at it um and i suppose i got i i then got increasingly into football um when i was at university as well uh, became a southampton season ticket holder in i think 2002 um, and started going really regularly to, to games, but just as a fan, as a spectator. Um, and I didn't really start thinking about football at all until um, Jonathan Wilson brought out the blizzard, um, which I think was like maybe 2010, 2011. And I'm not sure how I came across it, but, but about the same sort of time I'd started writing the occasional thing about football myself but very much like football and culture so maybe it would be football as represented in a, a novel or a, an artwork I, I remember writing about Stanley Chow's uh, illustration of Pirlo and writing about Nabokov and how he was a goalkeeper and then I came across the blizzard and I was like oh this this is the kind of football writing that I aspire to do and then because it was edited by Jonathan I then picked up a copy of Inverting the Pyramid. Um, and that was the point at which I found, obviously, this, I, I suppose, Inverting the Pyramid is kind of an intersection of tactics and history. Um, and I realized that tactics was probably the thing I was going to be most interested in. Uh, and it sort of went from there, really. It's interesting that you touch upon history and because, like, within the tactical element of the game, it's essentially telling the story, isn't it, of the game. So could you say you're more appealed to get into football, perhaps by the mere aesthetic, by the actual storytelling? I think that's, I think the aesthetics are part of it. So I, when I was at university, I studied English and uh, I started doing postgraduate research. And a lot of that was in intertextuality. So spotting patterns between different texts where, uh, you know, like a, maybe a sentence was borrowed or an idea or a character was transferred across. Um, and then uh, I worked for uh, the police for six years. And again, pattern spotting in, uh, you know, sort of, intelligence stuff I guess was was something that I was interested in so that idea of recognizing patterns particularly visual patterns subsequently when I started looking at football uh, and also rugby I used to do it in rugby as well um, was was definitely something that appealed to me uh, I I have a very visual memory so if I see a certain kind of move played out a number of times, then I'll recognize it and I'll know where I've seen it before. And I can recall parts of games in my head quite well, I think. Uh, and that, that extends to other types of visual memory. Like I can remember places really clearly. I can, you know, if you, <laughs> if you ask me to describe a particular holiday or something, I might not remember how I felt on the holiday but I could tell you exactly what the hotel looked like it's just a strange quirk of the way my brain works um and I think that's that's one of the reasons like Wilson and also to a lesser extent Michael Cox's work on tactics kind of opened up to me the idea that they could be interesting and then when I started watching games with that knowledge in my mind I I started to to appreciate that I could recognize these things happening uh, and then I started to be able to anticipate certain things or recall where I'd seen things happening previously. Um, and then it just became a question of describing it, really. Um, but obviously, because tactics, like you say, has that kind of historicity, like it does evolve, there are developments and recursions, then it it does, I think, lend itself to 
people who like to think about stuff in that sort of way, who like to think not just Liverpool are doing this and I saw them doing it last week, but also, you know, what's the history of pressing or what's the history of using fullbacks aggressively or how does this relate to, I don't know, a Dutch 4-3-3 or the spacing between the lines being more reminiscent of what Saki was doing or whatever it is that kind of these things pop up in your head if you read lots and consume lots. And obviously all these curiosities kind of intersected for you, Alex. You had football, you had storytelling, you had pattern recognition, and it led to an opening at TIFO Football. I'm curious, I mean, where did it all begin for the likes of yourself and Joe Define? How did you two become acquainted? So Joe and I initially met because Joe had a podcast called The Illustrated Game. Um, and it was very funny. Um, he would do kind of like weird songs and stuff. Um, and also Philippe Fenner, who's one of our illustrators at TIFO and Alice, who is Joe's sister, who's our studio manager. They were involved in that as well. And they would produce these beautiful drawings or paintings of football and that would go on a website and then Joe would produce a pod. And because I lived in North London, uh, not Cricklewood at that point, actually, I think I was, where was I? I was in Crouch End. Um, and Joe was living in Walthamstow. So he said, oh, do you want to come up and be on the podcast? Because he'd seen me on Twitter or something. So that was where we first met. Um, and then Joe, Joe started doing social for TIFO, which at that point was actually called UMAXIT and was just a website putting out some written content but in support of a kind of predictor game thing that was developed by Neil Clerk who was the other person who was involved in TIFO at that point um, and and then I got a job also doing social media stuff for that and doing a bit of writing and Joe was doing a bit of writing um, and it kind of bobbed along like that for a little while um, and then Joe and I'm trying to remember when it would have been, maybe 2017, something like that. But Joe had the idea to start doing video. Um, and initially it was him doing it, like he, he made the videos. Um, but the idea was to kind of reach out to a, a different audience to provide a certain kind of, of football content, but on YouTube, because previously football content on YouTube had largely been, you know, kind of compilation clips and, best ofs and, and stuff like that, or occasionally talking head things. Um, and we wanted to do more of the stuff that we did in a written form, but to put it on YouTube and we used illustrations to get around copyright issues, basically. If you can't show match footage and you don't want your videos to get taken down, but you still want to talk about football, illustrations are a really good way of getting around that. Um, so I then started writing more scripts for that. Um, and as I was saying to you before, um, before we started recording, I, I then got a job working in the coffee industry, but in digital strategy for that, and uh, learned a lot from some of the people I was working with and thought, well, TIFO has a fantastic product, like it's genuinely unique. Um, it was at that point, we've, <laughs> we've had some imitators since then, but, um, you know, it, it's it, it's in a field that I really find interesting. Um, and I now, ha having worked for this company for a year and worked with some really smart people, I have a much better sense of how digital businesses work. So I pitched the idea to Neil and Joe um, and Seb, who was around at the time as well and is still with us as the content editor, that I should come on board full time and kind of help try to monetize this. Because at that point, the product was fantastic, but there was so much effort put into just sustaining content production that it was very, very difficult to then actually try and do anything with that because no one had the time. Um, so yeah, that was, that was how I came on board. And then obviously Joe and I worked very, very closely together during that period. Seb was also part of that team. Um, Philippe joined us as a full-time illustrator as the kind of the next employee. Uh, and then we had some other people come on um, and it sort of grew from there. 
you know, fast forward a few years later, Alex, and a key milestone in your guys' growth was the acquisition by the Athletic. You know, at the time, it only seemed to accelerate a growth and still does to this day. I mean, how did you guys handle that process? Um, obviously, I mean, you guys have gone from strength to strength recently. But even availing the likes of in-house journalists such as James Hardcastle, you know, Michael Cox, in terms of doing tactical videos. But, I mean, what did you guys feel about that? So initially, The Athletic approached us uh, to sponsor the podcast. Um, <clears throat> so this was when they were looking to launch in the UK. Uh, Ed Malian had already started assembling a team under Alex Kajelski, who's the editor-in-chief of the UK. Um, and obviously, even at that point, it was very clear that some really impressive journalists were going to join. I'd actually already been a subscriber to The Athletic for about six months because at that point in time, TIFO was thinking about ways that we could expand. And, and one of the ways that we could expand would be to start producing uh, our material in, in the same style, but on different sports. So we would have different sports verticals. We we played around with basketball for a bit um, and we were looking at other things. And obviously a lot of those growth sports would be American. So I thought, well, I'll get a subscription to The Athletic because they seem like they're quite good at American sports. Uh, and we quickly thought, actually, these guys, <laughs> these guys are really, really good. And I know that sounds like the kind of thing that people say after a company's then gone and bought them, but it is genuinely the case um, that, that I was a, a subscriber well before that happened. Um, and in terms of how they pitched it to us, it was very much that there was an alignment in terms of the way that they wanted to talk about football in terms of the way we were talking about football. Um, obviously, like you say, the quality of the journalists, people like James Horncastle, Rafa Einstein, Michael Cox, people that I was reading, you know, to, to kind of learn from. Um, and, and then I think, I suppose, in terms of the process itself, like it was really interesting to go through. I mean, I'd never been through that kind of thing before. Um, and obviously, you know, we met with them when, when an acquisition started to look more likely and they they asked us about what our plans would be what we would do if it were to occur that kind of stuff like all, all the normal things that you would ask um and it was really exciting because you know for us the the balance with tifo was always like i say to 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 continue to produce content but also to try and sustain that process by making money, which as a small business operating on the internet, particularly on YouTube, is really, really difficult. Um, and so for us, being acquired was, it wasn't necessarily the end game in the sense of like, oh, that's great because, you know, we'll, we'll get something out of being bought out. It was more like it's the most sensible way of ensuring that TIFO continues as a brand. Um, I, I think it would be very, very difficult for us to have survived the pandemic, for example, without that acquisition having come through first. And it was literally weeks before, um, I think it was, I think it was a couple of, I think maybe with the paper, it was actually signed like a week after lockdown had started, but it was basically like really on the nail for the first one. Um, and then in terms of how it's been since then, like, again, as I was saying to you before, um, they, I think what's really great about it is that they have such a strong core offering that, that we can kind of play around with what we want to try and do. Um, we have a degree of security in terms of being allowed to experiment, particularly on IRL. Um, with different formats, different approaches. Obviously, we've we've got the tactics board, and that's kind of quite a core TIFO offering in terms of being a, a fairly straightforward transition from the way that we used to do illustrated videos. But some of the other things that we've been able to do, whether it's the football manager video or the um, uh, the recent thing that we did with the rebranding of the Super League, um, you know that that there's a kind of an experimentation there. Um, and as far as they're concerned, uh, like we can just go for that, you know, we can see what works and what doesn't, oh, you know, obviously we, we have a responsibility to, 
to produce regular content that's consumed in good numbers by people but how we go about achieving that we have a huge amount of latitude um, and as you say we have access to a phenomenal newsroom so we're able to convert articles into videos and and bring those articles to a different audience which is fantastic um, we are able to collaborate in in terms of some of the IRL stuff with journalists so we've had Joey Derso on for example talking about things uh, to do with football and finance which is amazing because he's he's brilliant um, or if I'm researching a video on I don't know AC Milan or something I can drop James Horncastle a quick message and say what's happening with x y or z and and find out some stuff and that you know that the, the the established journalists are all extremely generous with their time uh, and, and with their insight. Um, and I think as well, because The Athletic has this club model, it, it makes us consistently aware that there are teams outside the top six. I mean, TIFO has always been pretty good at covering a broad array of stuff. Um, but you know, some of the quality of writing that I don't, like Michael Bailey will do on, on Norwich or Jay will do on Brentford, like that, that makes you think, oh, actually we should, we should have a look at that because this is a really interesting article. So we've got a Brentford video out, uh, in the next couple of days on basically how Brentford do their stuff and how clever they are. And, and a lot of that work is, is based on things that have popped up in the athletic, um, and I think that keeps us like broadly focused, which is really good because um, we want to appeal to as wide an audience as possible. We don't want to just cover, you know, you know, if you put out a video on Man United or Arsenal, it's going to get two, three times as many views as a video on Brentford. But that doesn't mean that Brentford shouldn't be covered. It doesn't mean that Sampdoria shouldn't be covered or... I don't know, um, Nice or whomsoever, like there are lots of interesting teams out there. And I think sometimes the battle is to narrow our focus down and choose from all of the interesting stories and, and pick the two or three per week that we're going to focus on. It really sounds like the ultimate treasure trove if you're a football hipster, Alex, but um, and the world's biggest football buffet at that. But obviously... You guys have enjoyed exponential growth over the years with you know this season hitting over 1 million subscribers on YouTube. I mean, what are the added challenges and I suppose responsibilities of being a huge football media outlet at the moment? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, I think I think TIFO's always tried to um, have a broad approach to football and talk about things surrounding the game um, that are important. So we've looked at football and climate change. We've looked at the ownership of various Premier League clubs. Um, when we produced a video on the new owners of Newcastle United, then and people were saying, oh, well, you know, why are you not paying attention to who owns Chelsea or who owns Manchester City? We could point them to videos that we produced years ago in concert with James Montague, who's the journalist who wrote those videos, and say, so, yeah, no, we 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 did that a while back. Like, you know, TIFO has always had a kind of um, a, a sense of the fact that people should be informed about football, and whether that's me informing them on what a good four four two looks like, or James Montague informing them on how. Roman Abramovich made his money or whatever, that stuff is really important. Um, I think at the moment, obviously, you know, there are there are various spotlights on football and football is at the center of, of various conversations. Now that it may appear more so to us because we're in it and those conversations might be going on with equal ferocity in different walks of life and because we're not so deeply imbricated in those we're not aware of them but I think I think yeah we we try to we try to be responsible uh we try to make sure that we don't take sides in anything we present stuff impartially um but we also try to bring important stories to light and talk to you know the audience in a 
a respectful way. You know, we're not we're not pumping out stuff that implies that we think everyone who watches our video is an idiot. You know, it's like you you, you have to communicate with your audience as an equal and say, you know, you you're respecting us by watching our stuff. We're respecting you by producing it in a certain kind of way. And I think that's what we've always tried to do. Yeah, and I suppose one of the core tenets of the T4 approach has been to kind of make football tactics fun, informationable, um, accessible and digestible to the majority of the football fan. And you certainly haven't dumbed it down for anyone at all. But I suppose, you know, that Alex, with you being at the forefront of that, you know, leading the football tactical charge, I mean, I'm curious, how would you describe football tactics in its simplest form, perhaps, to an alien? Um, oh, I don't know. Um, I, I suppose, I suppose for me, the interesting question is that the degree to which you uh, imply intention when, when you're watching things happening, I, I would never say, or I try very hard not to say, because we can see a team doing this, it means the manager wants this to happen because like football is a very fluid and dynamic game and it can be very difficult to be that certain about it. But I would argue that the tactics, generally speaking, are uh, repeated movements and processes that reflect the way a team sets out to win a game. Um, and obviously those can be attacking or defensive or transitional. Um, and, and then you start digging into the different ways that different teams try to achieve that. And I think with TIFO, what we've always sought to do is, is present a sense of like, if, if you were to watch this team across the course of two or three months, these are the things that you would consistently see because obviously tactics is super complicated and players have specific game by game instructions and managers make tweaks on the basis of personnel and all of those things and it's simply impossible um certainly with an illustrated video but also with an irl video if we want to give it some longevity to dig into all of that stuff all of the time the videos would be three hours long and they'd be out of date after the next weekend so it's that's that's where some of that simplicity comes from is a recognition that you have to keep it that simple otherwise you bore people and things get out of date really quickly but one of the things that we're trying to do with the short videos now that we're also putting on tiktok is to dig out little snippets of things now some of those things will be consistent across the course of a season so like david reyes uh passing link with Ivan Tony, that's going to be a consistent thing that Brentford do across the course of the season. But other things will be a little bit more game by game. There'll be, you know, there'll be something that I've noticed at the weekend that will pique my interest. And I'll think, oh, you know, we can we can do a very quick explainer on that. And because those things are more bite size, then I guess it doesn't matter so much if if they go out of date. But one of the things that we we do always seek to do is to produce content that will be watchable in six months time or a year's time. Um, because again, like I certainly I'm conscious of the fact that for some people, TIFO is kind of a resource. Like it's a, a way that people will go and check on, you know, uh, I'm not quite sure what this team's pressing system is. I'll see if TIFO have it. A manager gets linked with a club maybe TIFO's got a video on it. So it's that kind of that kind of broad brushstroke thing which keeps that content relevant for longer, I think. Um, yeah, that's how we try to do it. I'm curious as well. And you spoke earlier on, Alex, saying that, of course, inverting the pyramid seminal work by Jonathan Wilson was, you know, key for your foundational knowledge when it came to football tactics. But were there any teams or historically, were there any sides over the years that piqued your interest or intrigued you to delve deeper? Um, not before I read Inverting the Pyramid, no. Um, because that was kind of the eyes open moment for me. Um, and and yeah, it is a seminal work. Like, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that certainly within terms of non-football 
people writing about football with that degree of insight and depth. I mean, there were books about tactics prior to that, but they were they were professional books aimed at a football practicing audience. Um, and Wilson was the first guy to kind of step across that divide um, and also show the development of it, which again is something we've talked about earlier on this this call. But that idea that that tactics has has cycles and evolutions and recapping of certain things and so on. Once I'd read that book, um, yeah, definitely there were. I mean, total football. Um, you know, the 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 Dutch Ajax side of the the early 70s and, and the Dutch national sides of 74 and 78. Um, David Winner's book, Brilliant Orange, kind of provided some really interesting context for that as well, more cultural context, which I found particularly interesting. Um, I would say Saki's AC Milan sides. Um, and then I think, I suppose, Obviously, what Guardiola's done across the course of his career and what Klopp's done across the course of his career, those are they're, they're the two most important current managers, I would say. Um, Bielsa is like a weird offshoot to that. And obviously, Bielsa is incredibly interesting. But aside from a small coterie of kind of diehard disciples, he doesn't, he doesn't have the same maybe breadth of influence directly um, because what he's seeking to do is is really quite difficult. Um, and, and I guess what's nice is that because those managers are so important, um, then other people take the time to write about them. So Marty Perenau's books on, on Guardiola, Honigstein's done a great book on Jurgen Klopp, um, and uh, obviously, various people have written about Bielsa, including Phil Hay, who I'm very privileged to call a colleague at The Athletic. Um, so I can dig into those things as well, um, which is which is excellent. Um, but yeah, I suppose I suppose it becomes then, and this is always the the difficulty with with working on things to kind of I guess a fairly tight schedule. And a, and a repeating schedule is that it, it becomes difficult to necessarily delve back into older teams as much as I'd like to, um, because I have to produce three or four videos a week, one way or another. Um, and it, it can be, I don't want to say frustrating, it's not frustrating, but there's, you have to achieve a balance between how much you can, how much you can spend time looking at things kind of speculatively and thinking, well, maybe something will come from this line of investigation versus having to produce content regularly um, of a high standard. Um, but I think we are looking at ways of maybe broadening the way that we do tactics a little bit, you know, kind of adding a little bit more background into some of the things, maybe going back and visiting a couple of older teams. I mean, we've done it with with Van Hal's Ajax 94-95, which is one of my favorite TIFO videos. Um, and I think there is scope to look at those teams, but but maybe to spend a little bit more time thinking about how they link up to modern football and, and trying to explain it in that way. I'm not I'm not sure yet, but I think I think we may be able to do something in that regard. Yeah, that'd be absolutely terrific to see. I mean, I think it's the perfect segue into the present day and if we're to focus a lens on the season, Alex. I mean, who, I suppose, is impressing you the most from a tactical point of view? And if any, are you noticing any distinguishable trends in any of the big five leagues? Um, I, I, I mean, I suppose like the, the, the two consistent trends of the last few years have been positional play and pressing and the degree to which they're instituted by various teams. And obviously that's sometimes that's a reflection of a manager's ethos. Sometimes it's a reflection of the quality of the squad available to that manager. Um, I think certainly from the Premier League, Brentford are really impressing me. I mean, I, I think the thing with, so I'm kind of like tactics agnostic, if that's not an incredibly <laughs> pretentious thing to say. Um, so I don't really, I don't really care 
how a team's doing something if what they're doing is really well executed. I mean, I kind of slightly do have a preference for defensive counter-attacking football based on a 4-4-2, but that's a personal thing. But, you know, I, 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 I can derive as much from, from watching Man City as I can from watching Liverpool as I can from watching Brentford. It's, it's when you can see that a team is repeatedly doing the same stuff and executing it well, and those moments of recognition where you're like, oh, okay, so if this guy gets the ball, that guy's going to drop in there and then that guy's going to make a third man run and you can just see it starting to unfold. Um, I think the use of fullbacks this season is interesting. Um, I mean, like Man City against Liverpool was a really good example of, of fullbacks inverting and doing interesting things to create goal opportunities um, for other players um, for, for City. I think it was for midfielders. That sort of stuff is interesting, but then people have been doing weird stuff with fullbacks and, and also as centre-backs um, like Gasparini or um, uh, Chris Wilder, you know, for the last couple of seasons. So the, these things are recursive and, and stuff will dip in and out of fashion because somebody will work out how to counter it or in the case of Sheffield United, they'll have injuries to key players that mean they can't produce that particular style of football as effectively. And that's effective. You know, that's a way that other teams can then beat them because they just can't execute as they should be able to. Um, but those things will come back, um, I think, because, because effectively, you know, all of football really nowadays, I think, is, is about seeking to gain superiorities in different areas of the pitch right so numerical superiority qualitative superiority um there was a fantastic article on spielverlagerungen about this i can never pronounce that website correctly um and and i get you know teams are always looking for different ways to achieve that superiority aren't they so if you're brentford then having a goalkeeper who's really good with the ball at their feet and a striker who's got speed and power but also has excellent reading of the game and game intelligence means that you can achieve qualitative superiority against certain center backs or you can find space in a particular channel and get through if you're man city then you're going to achieve numerical superiority through possession and passing and rotations of movement and players being able to make runs into areas where traditionally you wouldn't find a fullback in inverted commas you know so different teams solve that problem in different ways and that to me is what's interesting it doesn't matter how they solve it um i don't like i said i don't prefer one solution to another it's seeing them figuring it out that i find really interesting and obviously with the amount of content you guys produce on a weekly basis alex i mean how many games of football would you consume on an average basis a week, uh, so it depends if I'm doing the podcast or not. Um, so we, because JJ Bulls joined us um, to to do tactical analysis as well, um, and also bring his his particularly uh, anarchic sense of humour uh, to the IRL channel. Um, we can alternate that role on the podcast. So if 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 it's a podcast, I'll probably watch. I don't know five, six games over the weekend. Um, we also have access to Y Scout. So, um, uh, you know, if I'm preparing a video, then the first thing I'll do when I look at a team is I'll probably look at how they scored their last 30 or 40 goals, how they conceded their last 30 or 40 goals. That will give me a good basic indication of, you know, what they're good at and what they're bad at. Um, then I will focus on attacking build-up and defensive structure. Uh, and I probably, generally, I'd look at transitions last of all. Um, I find usually if you're preparing to watch, uh, if you're preparing a video on a particular team, um, paying attention to the first sort of 20 or 30 minutes is usually a really good 
basic kind of intro into that team because teams tend to retain their, again, intended, but that's a slightly problematic word, but they tend to have their intended structure and patterns most clearly at the beginning of a match, obviously. Um, but yeah, it varies a lot. And, and sometimes I get to work on stuff that's not tactical. So like I did a, a big guide to uh, match fixing, which was really interesting. Um, so when I worked on that, I probably didn't watch very much football at all um, because I was busy doing something else. But yeah, it's a lot, but it's it's not necessarily just whole matches. I think that's the other thing. Um, so I was preparing some stuff on Florian Wirtz earlier. So again, I, I'm I'm not gonna for a for a short video like a one minute video. I'm not gonna watch full Leverkusen games. Um, and through Y Scout, I can hone in on what Wirtz does in individual games and pick up things from that instead. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting answer, I suppose, and it gives context to the overall work. But yet, of course, you guys don't only do tactical videos. You also do work in relation recently to football manager, sensible mm. transfers over the years. I mean, if I had to push you, Alex, what would be probably your most favorite piece or series of content that you guys love producing? So for me personally, it's sensible transfers um, because... I, I, it just gives me an excuse to combine data and tactics, which are my two favorite things in football. Um, and actually data, the use of data and data visualization particularly is, has been one of the most exciting things to see happen in the last couple of years. And I'm, I'm not talking about in the professional game, but in terms of journalism. So obviously the athletic now has Tom Warville and Mark Carey working and there's also loads of really good people on Twitter producing visualizations. Um, and, and yeah, Sensible Transfers gives me the opportunity to, to use data, but also with that kind of tactical understanding, because you can't just go and find, you know, a player who's got really good progressive passing stats and assume that they're going to fit any team, um, because obviously that's not how football works. So there's a nice kind of level of nuance to that. I mean, we've we've pushed sensible transfers recently into a slightly broader approach. Um, so I'm not picking quite so many niche players. Um, although I still take a certain amount of pleasure in the fact that people like Borna Sosa, who I was talking about like two or three years ago, um, are uh, you know doing quite well for Stuttgart now. Um, but it's yeah, it's just fun and it's an opportunity to keep my interest broad like watch lots and lots of different teams and I end up with like literally pages and pages of notes and I have terrible handwriting and I kind of squiggle all of these things down and then I come back to them like a month later I, I have no idea what I've written I can barely understand myself um, but that's that's always fun and where do you see it all headed Alex, I suppose. I mean, where do you see the future of football media going and where exactly does T4 football fit within that big picture? I mean, it's it's incredibly hard to say, isn't it? Like, I think in terms of TIFO, you know, obviously we're part of a, of a really successful company at the moment. Um, and the, the Athletic is going from strength to strength and has some really exciting plans for how it's going to develop. And obviously we're we're part of that development but also as i explained earlier we have a certain degree of latitude to produce slightly different things and i think that that tifo is always going to be looking to to try different stuff and see if people like it and that's part of the fun of being on youtube is that you can experiment with with content in terms of concepts in terms of delivery um obviously by bringing jj on we've added a different kind of personality to the mix which has been fantastic um first and foremost jj is a really really good analyst but um he also you know fits in nicely with with what we're all like as well um because youtube does have that kind of personality element to it um future of sports media like i don't know man <laughs> it's um, fortunately, it's above my pay grade to have to think about such things. Um, but I, I think what I would say is I think the audiences are getting increasingly sophisticated. 
Um, there was a, a funny Armando Iannucci sketch um, that my girlfriend showed me the other day where there's like a couple of guys sat in a basement in a pub and they're sort of wired up giving opinions to football fans. Um, and then someone cuts the cord and suddenly the fans have got nothing intelligent to say. Um, and I think that that obviously that's a slight piss take, isn't it? But I think fans, a lot of fans are getting more sophisticated. The proliferation of, of freely available stuff, particularly on Twitter, but also on YouTube has helped. Uh, I don't want to say educate because that's maybe a bit patronizing, but helped expose fans to different ways of thinking about football that are interesting and challenging. And so the challenge for a company like The Athletic, which exists behind a paywall, is to continue to be ahead of that curve um, in terms of breadth and quality. And I think it, it manages that. Um, and the challenge for us is to be able to maintain that level of interest, to keep looking for new and different ways to talk about football, to produce football adjacent content, which is interesting to to fans. I think we want to also try and talk to fans who are maybe not watching every game at the weekend, who aren't like a diehard fan of Southampton or Brentford or Liverpool, but but have a casual interest and want their want their interest peaked a little bit. Um, and again, I think that the the latitude that we have for experimentation uh, under the athletics umbrella gives us the scope to try and talk to those people in different kinds of ways, which is really exciting. Um, so I, yeah, I, my overall sense would be, would be a positive one. I mean, obviously there are challenges to, to digital publishing and all of that stuff. But like I say, I'd, <laughs> for the time being, I don't need to think about any of that, which is great. And I suppose to close, I mean, one question I always ask guests at the end, Alex, is what advice would they have for them in their irrespective industries, be it coaching, recruitment, sports science? I mean, for all the aspiring football agnostics out there, what advice have you for them? Um, I would say I would say consume as much as you can. Um, read widely, watch widely, watch games, watch coverage. Um I think, I think actually, so when I first got into it, people would talk about finding your niche. And yes, there is an argument for that to a degree, like expertise is good. But I also think that nowadays within football media, having a broad skill set is actually really important. And so from that perspective, it may be, it may be that you're an expert in Eastern European football. Um, but acquiring additional skills such as video editing or podcast editing or talking on camera. And these are things that people can practice, right? You can make TikToks, you can do Instagram lives. You like it's you don't have to spend any money to acquire these skills. Um, I think that elevates people's employability because, because increasingly companies are looking for people that can do a variety of different things. Um, and even if they're not looking for people who can do a variety of different things, if you're, you know, a smart, young sports news journalist, there are going to be others that are as smart as you and have the same level of experience and so on. But if you can say, and I've also done this podcast for the last three years, and I've also done some Instagram reels that I can show you here, you know, that that's the sort of thing I think that that elevates you as a potential employee. Um, but yeah, I guess also, I mean, if you're going freelance, very boring practical advice is like, know your rights, understand tax, <laughs> be nice to people, um, which is not kind of sexy or cool, but is also extremely important and helpful. Um, and, uh, yeah, and reach out to people. And that, that's actually the last thing I'd say is like, I um, certainly when I started, uh, I was able to find people like Jonathan, uh, Ian McIntosh, who obviously I've gone on to work with quite a lot, who were very generous with their time and advice. Um, and I think actually people starting out would, would maybe be surprised by how willing established journalists are to help them. Um, and that's that's something that I would you know 
send people a, a message, try and get hold of an email address or whatever, and 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 you know, obviously be nice and 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 be polite and not assumptive. But actually, the majority of people that I've come across in the industry are really sound and and will seek to help where it's possible. So yeah, don't don't be scared to to try and go there um, because it's it's a good thing to try and do. Alex Stewart, it's been an absolute privilege to have you on and to get a wide overview of what goes on behind the scenes at TIFO Football. Of course, I wish you and all the guys at TIFO all the continued success for the future. Thanks for coming on. No, thanks very much for having me. It's been really fun.